Welcome to End of Life University. Today I'm sharing with you an interview I did with Mary McLaughlin about Irish keening and wakes, which is really interesting and fascinating. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, before you, we move on to the interview, be sure to subscribe so you can get notifications when I post new interviews here on this channel. So here we go. Today I'm so excited to welcome my guest all the way from Ireland, across the Atlantic Ocean, Mary McLaughlin. Mary is a singer, songwriter, and teacher who is steeped in the Ulster Gaelic song tradition of her native Ireland, where she was born and raised. Mary records, performs, and teaches workshops in Irish singing and technique and Gaelic song and culture. She has toured extensively throughout the UK, Ireland, and North America, teaching and performing at Celtic Irish camps. She has recorded five CDs to international acclaim, written two songbooks, and completed a PhD in Irish Other World Song. Her particular expertise is in the Keen, which we'll be talking about today, Gaelic Christmas songs and fairy song. Currently, Mary teaches Gaelic song in the Ulster tradition online to students from several countries through classes and individual lessons. And that's how I heard about Mary's work from one of her students who contacted me. And you can learn more about Mary and her workshops at her website, marymclaughlin.com. So Mary, welcome and thank you so much for joining me. It's a great pleasure, Karen. I, I, the one thing that I do love about the online world is we can have these sort of transatlantic conversations. <laughs> Oh, no, it, it's every time, every time we do this, it seems like a miracle to me that it's even possible that we're sitting here looking at each other and, and having a conversation together. But it's a great gift. It is. My father passed away about 11 years ago and the, the whole Internet thing was just coming up. I was living in the States at the time and I used to call my sister on Skype and one day she put my father on. And it was the most hilarious conversation because he kept saying, it can't be her. It can't be. It's not possible. It must be a recording. She's 6,000 miles away. How can it be? <laughs> <laughs> and even I'm still, even I still can't believe it sometimes. Like, how, how, is, how is this happening? But, but it's wonderful. Yeah, this is good. Well, I'm very excited to learn from you. I've always been fascinated by what I've heard, at least, about Irish cultural traditions around the end of life, but haven't known very much about it. And I wondered if you'd start by talking to us about the Irish wake, maybe the history of the wake and some of the traditions around it. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to say you're not alone in not knowing much about it because people in Ireland don't know much about it. It's uh, something that's been very, very steeped in secrecy for a very long time. Um, it, was, it wasn't always like that, but it has been over the last 100, 150 years, something that's been kept very much under wraps. So um, when I first started studying, I did a master's in um, chant, ritual chant and song, and I wrote my dissertation on the king. And that was about 10 years ago. And everybody thought I was completely bonkers. You know, it was just like this strange thing and we don't talk about it, you know. So that's a, a, an important thing. It's now coming up, like it is worldwide, this uh, leaning towards understanding more about how to grieve and how to um, help the dying. That type, those, those understandings are coming up now. So... The actual, you know, the history of the king goes back, or, or the wake, big pardon, goes back so, so long. I mean, it's what we get are remnants of ancient traditions, which evolved over time. So in ancient Ireland, now I'm not talking about Celtic Ireland. Celtic Ireland is only, you know, less than 3,000 years old. There are monuments in the, on the island of Ireland and England and Scotland and Wales which go back 6,000 years. Wow. And we don't know who actually built those monuments. Um, Ireland is full of them. Uh, like I used to say to my students over there, you can't walk <laughs> you can't walk a mile without tripping over a monument and it, <laughs> or, or falling down one, you know. But they were very often monuments to death. Um, the tombs, you know, the, the court tombs, what they say, they, they were nobility were buried in this way. Now, 
what happened to the normal peasant not so much obviously but to the noble people and the chieftains there were very special deaths which really resonated with um, Egypt and ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and so there were grave goods were found as you know uh, archaeologists have discovered grave goods in these ancient tombs there's evidence of funerary feasts um, there were cremations which of course involved fire um, and right you know all of these things began to come up you know in time not just in Ireland but everywhere um, I've just uh, looking through a, a wonderful book where it mentions Hector from the Iliad and how Hector's wake wasn't that different from modern Irish waking um, and you know the Iliad was composed about 10,000 years ago so this is a very very deep very archetypal uh, experience for people to in some way mark and honor the dead um, Joseph Campbell you know who's one of my favorite writers once said that archetypes the same archetypes appear in different countries in different costumes and I think that just about sums it up so it's not unique to Ireland that's one thing I want to say right off the bat it's just the way that the Irish do it would be a little different to the way that the Mexicans do it would be a little different to the way that some African tribes would do it etc 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 so the um, forerunners if you like which really became a hallmark of Irish wakes were the funerary feast the communal eating very important piece the fire at the time of the ancient burials, it was cremation and it was ashes that were being found, the cremated bones that were being found in the tombs. Then it moved to burial. Well, it was the funeral pyre, of course, for the, for the, uh, for the um, cremation. But as it moved to burial, there were torches were used and they signified the fire. And then gradually that would come down into candles. So although everybody thinks that the candles at wakes are Christian, they're actually a combination of pagan and Christian. And mm -hmm. it's one of the things about Ireland, there's this, uh, what we call it, Celtic Christianity, and it's very strong in Ireland, where paganism and Christianity lie alongside each other. So you get all of those artifacts going on. You also get both Christian and pagan customs happening. Now, I would say the wakes were really thriving in the Middle Ages. Um, things began to get, uh, the Christian church in the late Middle Ages became, became very, very autocratic. It wasn't in the early Celtic Christian church, it wasn't. But it became very autocratic, it became very much about, you know, there can be no other, we're not, we're not allowing anything else here. And so the wakes were very much looked down on and denigrated and actually forbidden and things like that so they kind of went underground a bit um the first time i really uh understood uh, this idea was in the 1990s when i was with my mother and um we were getting some petrol and uh it was, in the 1990s people used to come and put petrol in your car you know you didn't have the self-service mm -hmm. so the man came out from the garage she knew him she says how are you doing johnny he says, oh, I'm awful tired, Mrs. I'm awful tired. She says, why is that? Three funerals last night. I'm awful tired. And we came, I said, what? That's that poor man. What, what? I mean, imagine losing three. She said, he wouldn't have even known them. And I said, what? She said, he's a professional waker. Hmm. I said, he's a what? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, he looks in the paper. He's, he's lived in this community for a very long time. He looks in the paper, he sees who's died. He does a quick bit of research, but he probably knows everything about them because he knows everything about everybody. And, you know, small community. And he would turn up with a bottle of whiskey and he would sit down and he'd start passing the whiskey around and say, oh, what a great, great man, terrible loss to the community, terrible loss to the community altogether. What are we going to do with that? She said, he would get them all wound up and when they wound up, he'd go on to the next funeral. Meanwhile, you know, the family would pass him a few quid for having helped getting the morning launched. So that was the first time I heard of this concept. <laughs> um, and it's not always like that, but that 
very much if you read report even in the 1970s it's that type of a thing that it's um it's about getting focus has, is on getting the morning launched getting people relaxed enough to be able to cry that involves laughter because laughter will release crying and so um you get all these different reports about people in the wake who you know uh, are playing these weight games and this was another thing that caused a great deal of controversy and anger among the clergy in the late middle ages especially the 1600s 1500s but in actual fact the weight games go back to these ancient chieftain funerals there are reports of them, the clicky quincha the, the keening games and they were actually games of strength trials of strength between young men in particular when they come back when they come into the the Irish wake that there are all sorts of different things going on um, first of all what does the word wake mean it means keeping awake watching that's what it means it doesn't mean waking the corpse it means keeping keeping awake in order to do that people have got to be occupied because they're going to start falling asleep and the idea is you sit with the corpse and so there would be games to keep them going and quite often there'd be tricks played, especially on older community members, you know, like they would start nodding off and then the younger ones would tie their tie their feet to the chair or something and then they'd, then they'd poke them and they'd wake up and they'd get up and they'd fall over, things like that. Whereas people would laugh, they were clowning about. Um, there was those going on, there were uh, often trials of strength, there were specific games which were quite complicated um, and there were uh, very bawdy games. And all of these were about keeping awake and about affirming life in the face of death. There were two functions there going on. Everything in the wake had function. There was nothing that was coincidental or accidental. Now, this isn't some somebody sat down like we would these days and plan it out, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, let's have this element and this it didn't work like that. These are things that were so archetypal, so natural to humanity that they evolved and people kept the things that worked for them. There were two main characters in the wake. One of them was the Barakam, and not he's not so much known as the other one who was the Van Quincia, the Keening woman. I'll come to her in a minute. But the Barakam was was the male balance to the female Keener. And the Barakam would have been a, a local local man. He would have been somebody who um, was liked, knew everybody, was very social, everybody trusted him, and he would be in charge of the social side of the wake, if you like. So he'd organise the wake games, all of that stuff. There'd be three women called the Mara, the, the Mara Barn, the three white women, and they would be laying out the corpse. And then there'd be the keening women. The main keener was called a Ban Quincia, a keening woman but there would be maybe four, maybe even eight of them. And I'm talking about wakes in the late Middle Ages, coming right up until the 20th century, you know, that sort of time. And so it was kept very secretive because it was not approved of, you know? Mm -hmm. So there were all these different things happening at the wake and it would go on possibly for three days because if there was somebody coming from they wouldn't go as far abroad as America because that would take a week to get back. By the time two weeks, by the time the news would get over and the news would get back, you know, the, the person would come back. Unlike our instantaneous connection, yes. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so three days usually would get back people back from Scotland or from England, and um, that would be close relatives. So people would be totally exhausted by that time. Three days of this morning with keeping awake the whole time so there had to be lots of stimulus so that's kind of the background to that one um i'm i'm interested in the idea that uh people from the outside like who perhaps didn't even know the deceased w would assist with it so sometimes were the keeners and all the people involved sometimes from the outside not family members or it wouldn't be family members, they would normally be community members, if that allowed. Certainly the Borokong would be a community member. 
but we're, we're talking about in Ireland rural communities that you know might stretch over a mile or two miles and there might just be a scattering of families there you know um, and this was an opportunity for them to get together it was a big opportunity for community and you know as people grew up uh, you know it'd be an opportunity for teens to get together you know there wasn't much social life so it was a bit of a do you know to go to a wake and they wouldn't necessarily know the person who died it might be some elderly farmer who they'd never seen there'd be different kind of tone at tones to the wakes because if it was somebody like a young person who had died tragically in an accident then that'd be a very different tone to somebody who you know was 95 years of age and it was their time and they passed on um, and I mean by that there'd be different tones in the attitudes of the people who, who would have gone to the wake there wouldn't necessarily be different ritual but there'd be different tone tonality about it um, with the keeners keening is an Irish and I'll talk extensive about keening in a minute but it's it's high art it's very difficult not everybody can keen in, in the Irish way it's demanding you know so you have to be a good singer and there may not have been a good singer in the area so people would send out to be known somebody you know up the mountain or in the nearest town river she's a great keener so they would send out four keeners and that would happen and, and, the, and you know the keener would come along and would just you know perform the ritual that she was performing um, find out more or less during the course of the evening or three days if it was that long uh, you know the details but there was there was there were formula there was a formula and the family would fill in the details as they went along so yeah it was a really um, it was a really interesting thing. I was I was fascinated by that too. The idea that you know somebody who didn't know the person who died personally, how how could they possibly grieve them? But because there's these, this formula there, um, then the, the keeners would have followed that. That's it's fascinating to me, and I'm remembering back when um, my cousin died. So she well, she was a younger woman when she died, and in the mourners' room, the family who were there, we were all each one of us was kind of in our own world, in our own world of grief, and no one talked to one another. We just all sat there silently, and I and at the time it felt so painful we needed to talk but we didn't know how to do it and i was just thinking of this idea of someone who comes in and is able to start the conversation and just help us open and help us be in a place where we could just share like this is horrible this is terrible what a tragic loss that we're all experiencing and so i i'm i i, I felt that sense of how hard it is sometimes to open up to your own family when you know that they're hurting as much as you are and how helpful someone from the outside who's not in that same place could be at eliciting those feelings absolutely and supporting those feelings and you know the the, the bang queen here in the older days i mean nowadays we have you know thank heavens a lot of with death doulas we have hospitals we have a lot of support there didn't used to be that support. There was just the family who were quite often paralyzed, you know, because that is a natural, uh, you know, reaction, especially to a sudden death. There's a paralysis that happens. And certainly, like you say, everybody's in their own world. There's no space to help anybody else. You, you, you're barely surviving yourself, you know, trying to make sense of something that seems so unexplainable. Um, but... Um, one of the things that uh, the, the band Queen she did, well, they did they had three main functions, to be honest. One of the functions was to comfort. So they took that job on. Um, their presence would help. They, um, they would do what needed to be done to help people begin to, to come to terms with what had happened. Uh, another function, and it's the one that's become the most prominent they're known for um, was to release grief and to help people release grief but the original function probably and this is only hypothesis um, but probably the original function was spiritual it was to help transfer 
and spirit from the body that had died into the next world. And that was then taken on by the priests, which is one of the reasons why there was this dissonance that happened in the late Middle Ages, because the priests totally resented um, anybody thinking that they could do a better job hmm. of that spiritual transfer. So that was one of the things that helped to claim both the wake and the king, because the king, to me, um, was the jewel. It was the jewel in the crown of the wake. It was the apex of the wake in so many ways. And it would keep coming up. It wasn't just once. It'd be round after round after round. And the king would continue right to the burial ground. And it would continue to the burial ground, um, which could be half a mile away or a quarter of a mile away in these, in these very rural areas. And the body would be put on a, in a cart or um, if, if it was closer, it'd be carried in, you know, in, in some sort of container, either a, at least a shroud, but usually some sort of coffin. Um, and you know, the keeners would sit on top of the coffin. And I once um, spoke to a man in County Clare. He was a farmer and he was, I would say, in his late 60s when I spoke to him. And I had just begun this sort of exploration of keening. And you know, the first reaction was, well, that's very morbid. And then he suddenly said, I remember them. I said, oh, what? tell me, you know. He said, I was very small, probably four or five maybe. Um, and I was on turf. I was on the hill cutting turf with my father, which would have been a very normal thing that happened in the nineteen. I'd say the nineteen thirties probably. And he said, "You heard them before you saw them." And as he spoke, like this sixty-year-old face <laughs> sort of disappeared, and there was a very frightened-looking five-year-old. Mm. It was quite phenomenal. It had been such a, an impactful experience for him. And he said, "And they sit on top of the coffin." He says, with their hair everywhere and them wailing at the tops of their voices. Hmm. And I mean, I, I, he, just with that, he brought me there. I got it completely. The, the awesomeness of it. And that's part of the spiritual thing too, you see. It's like something is different. Something is not of the norm. This is, this is beyond us, which is, of course, what happens at death. Where we, where we as, as living people, we experience that feeling of awe, of realisation. This is something incredibly special, different, and I don't understand it. And so this action of the keeners sitting on top of the coffin, and they always would have long unbound hair, that was part of it, um, and they'd be sweeping like this and, you know, going, oh, all this stuff, you know, really high, mm. coming down, you know. And... It would have been terrifying for a child, but also very sobering for anybody listening and bring it, it brings in the awe, awe in the real sense of the word, you know, um, which is, I, I feel, a very important um, element. I interviewed uh, somebody from my PhD who had witnessed uh, in the early 2000s a funeral and it was a very large funeral in one of the Irish speaking areas. And this person had not, you know, had like most Irish people not really been exposed to the to the traditional wake and the traditional keen because I mean I hadn't been, you know what I mean, when I was growing up there. So um it, it had dwindled so much by the nineteen thirties. Um so he was but you know, my generation or a bit younger than me. And uh, the report was phenomenal. You know, he said that there were three women who brought chairs, there were three chairs brought to the grave. It was a Catholic funeral. Um, the priest had been there, the coffin had been blessed. This was when the coffin had been lowered down. Lowered down. And he described the way these three women sat at the edge of the grave, with their feet right tipping on the edge. I mean, that's really, you know, in between worlds there. You know, mm -hmm. and he said they began to sing, and he said it was songs. They were singing songs, and it was like they were sisters. They were probably they were related to this person who had passed on, but he said um, 
they, they it seemed like they knew exactly where each one of them was going but they didn't sing exactly in unison and that's a very irish thing you know that to have the improvisation quality to to irish singing and so he said there were hundreds of people at this funeral and everybody just shut up he said there was something so incredibly eerie and um the way he put it he said it was an enchanted moment and those were his words an enchanted moment he said it was something to do with the landscape as well and there was by the ocean you could hear the wind you could hear the sea no other sound except this singing and it had had a profound effect on everybody there and that i think is just a very watered down experience of what would have happened a hundred years ago mm. wow it's so interesting this out of the ordinary experience which it seems reminds everyone there that because of the death of this person that we all love we've we've all transitioned we we're all transformed we're all different now and life will not be the same again and so it seems like we need that otherworldly exposure to remind us of that and even to usher us into that new place now where we will be living from now on and you have just described beautifully the three stages of ritual <laughs> whether or not you're aware of that no <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> well the three stages of ritual which were um named uh, by Arnold van Gennep in uh, 1909, so over 100 years ago, are separation, liminality, and incorporation, reincorporation. And so if a ritual is going to be completed, it needs those three elements. Very often the ritual isn't completed, and that's when people are stuck. So the separation here is the separation of every way. You know, there's the separation of the soul from the body for the, for the person who's passed on. There's the separation of the woman from the husband, or the wife from the uh, uh, the wife, the woman from the husband, or, or the man from the wife. The separation of the children from the parent, etc. The separation of everybody there from this person who was in the community. So that's the separation. So the liminality piece is that bit in between. It's that movement towards the final, and. Um, in liminality, anything goes. So rules can be broken. A big feature of, of, the, of the old um, uh, funeral in Ireland was that clocks would stop. They would literally stop the clocks in houses at the point of death. Hmm. Um, the man who described hearing the, um, the cortege coming, uh, he said how the down tools immediately. That's it. Work's done for the day now. We don't, we don't work. And just about um, five years ago, I, I was living in Limerick in uh, Munster in Ireland. And I was on a bus, just a regular bus going into town, and about three o'clock in the afternoon. And the bus stopped in the middle of the road. And I thought, oh, God, it's broken down. You know, why else would a bus stop in the middle of the road? And then a funeral cortege passed on the other side of the road. And I thought, that's incredible. Even today, the bus will stop to honour the funeral. Hmm. So, the, you know, the, the, there are all of these things that happen in that liminality space. And then, finally, the reincorporation is when people have accepted or begin the journey of acceptance, because it takes acceptance as a very, very long and slow process, as you know. But they begin that journey by coming home. And what will have happened, in the, especially in the older houses, is women from the community would prepare the room for the wake. Then, as the coffin has been taken out for the burial, they would put it on um, like chairs outside and they would lift it off these chairs and then they'd kick the chairs over. Hmm. That to me is like, you know, when you, when you do shamanic work, and that's what we call break state. So you're moving out of something. So it's a you know, sharp um, jerk out of one reality, beginning another reality. Hmm. And then if we go on to the 
uh, whatever happened in the burial ground and there'd be a lot more cleaning there and then people would come back to the house and that's when they would begin to reincorporate into society but as you say so rightly the status has changed because now the wife is a widow the child is an orphan so now we have to get used to a new way of being in this world without that particular person so those you know the wake with the keen really really addressed that need for that kind of completed ritual and that's why there were all these different stages to it and different um, events that happened in all parts of it. Um, the com you know, community eating is a part of ritual. Um, we see that all the time. Costume is a part of ritual. Um, even if it's as simple as wearing black, you know, everybody dresses differently. Now, in, in the older days, there's this wonderful, um, in 1960, I think it was, a uh, uh, called an Aran funeral and it was a photographer who'd gone out to Aran Island just to take photographs and as it happened there was a funeral and so he got to take these these photographs and Aran Island out in um, I think this one is in uh, there's a few Aran Islands in Aran but this one was not in Donegal it was down in Munster it's phenomenal looking at it island funeral it's called that's the name of the book and um, the women are all wearing red shawls hmm. and um, dark clothes under but these red shawls around their heads the men are wearing these sort of tweed trousers and a tweed waistcoat and a twisted belt hmm. um, like a crocheted belt and, ev and the flat cap and everybody's dressed this in these costumes which is their funeral gear and um, you know again I was just just um, reading something else um, recently about this, about years and years and years ago, very long ago, um, there was this idea of wearing, oh yeah, there was this description, that right, that's right, of uh, women um, wearing, again, red, uh, red skirts and coloured shawls hmm. um, and going on their bare feet to the funeral. So this idea of costume was really, you know, a big thing. It's become much less now, but there's still a little bit of it in that, you know, you you would not wear a floral, mad coloured dress to a funeral, even today, certainly in Ireland. You don't necessarily wear black anymore, but you would wear sombre clothes. Mm -hmm. There's still that idea. You wouldn't wear that to a wedding. S similar thing with the ritual, you know, appropriate costume. Um, and then there's the there's the the eating there's the costume there's usually sound and of course the big sound in the funeral is uh, well there's the chanting and the keening and that's another interesting thing because keening originally was always described as chanting you know and then of course the uh, the Latin priests would chant so I mean I was brought up in Catholic Ireland with the Latin Mass and with I loved it I loved the chanting but it struck me um, when my mum died that um, when I went into the house because um, she was waked at home and I had to I was, I'd been in hospital with her for a week I'd had no sleep I had to sleep because I was a basket case by this time and so I'd had a couple of hours sleep so I walked into the house from a neighbour's house and I thought, what's that chanting? And it was the priest was there. Hmm. And everybody was saying the rosary. But they were chanting it. And it really, really struck me. Um, and I thought, my goodness, we might, you know, I thought years later, because I didn't know about keening at that point, but years later I thought, you know, we, we didn't know about the keen, but it's never quite gone in Ireland because there's, there's this, hey, may I put a grace to God with thee, let's have that one, let's first then just, holy Mary, mother, this sort of a thing. So, and it brought me back to another experience that I'd had once um, when I was about 17 um, on, a, on, a, on an island, a penal island, um, where I'd heard people, the same thing, people praying, but they were praying in chant. So all of these little elements that are associated with ritual are all in there. <laughs> even today, you know, um, that's pretty amazing stuff.
I was thinking about how, in some ways, our our modern funerals here in the states. I don't, I don't think. I mean, most people have no knowledge of rituals and the components of a ritual, even why we have the rituals, because some families forego funerals altogether, which to me seems like a mistake. Like it seems like such an important time that we need to honor it and mark it in order to help our grief process. But then I remember hearing stories of, of you know, some families where they do the very thing you were talking about, everyone dresses in their loved one's favorite color for the funeral, that maybe we still have some instincts <laughs> toward these, these archetypal needs for certain rituals. And maybe we incorporate them without even knowing what we're doing or realizing. I it. think that's very, very likely. I really do. And this, I mean, I'm going to do a plug here for one of my favorite books. Um, he owes me. Some Someday this man's going to pay me back. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a wonderful book, My Father's Wake by Kevin Poulos. Ah, have you have you come across it? No, I haven't. Oh, it's fabulous. And he talks about, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a very real uh, lived experience book. But he talks about how he lost his brother in London very suddenly and what the... How did he put it? The death machine allowed us, you know, in for 15 minutes while they burned him or something like that. And then he talks about his father's death in Ackle Island in Ireland, where it come from. And the difference that that made them, and there's one particular line here which really burned into me. His brother was called Bernard. He said, Bernard's death was a wound that never healed. Mm. It was my father's death because we waked him we laid him out properly and it healed you know and so that's a very it's a, i would recommend anybody who is interested in this stuff be, to, to dive into this because it's so readable he's very knowledgeable he makes you know great um references etc but it's it's a beautiful book i picked it up by accident on Ackle island a few years ago and now i've, I've seen that he's been doing ted talks and all sorts of things so i'm delighted absolutely delighted beautiful piece of work but you know this idea of it's so important to be waked in Ireland it came up in the 700s it was so important to have this why didn't Christ have it why didn't Christ have a wake why wasn't Christ healed and this was a theme that came up with poets etc for a few hundred years and then eventually around about 1200 um, keens were composed in retrospect, for Christ. Hmm. And those keens are the only ones that um, have actually survived because the thing about a keen is it's improvised and it's personalized. There are four, there's a formula. There are three parts to it. There's a salutation, so that's obviously personalized, <laughs> um, uh, to, the, to the actual person, you know. Um, in the old days, it used to be hail, John or Hale Cormac or whatever it was. Now it would just be, be just this name, the name of the person over and over and over and over again. And of course, there's always, you know, there's, we know there's magic in names. I mean, fairy stories tell us that, you know. Harry Potter tells us that, you know, it's like mm -hmm. the, the magic in names. There's, names are very powerful. So this would be the opening thing that the keeners would do. They would salute the person. Then there would be the dirge. And the dirge is basically a, a verse and the verses would be extremely personal to that particular deceased person um, and it usually there'd be a eulogy in there um, so you know you you were the best you were the best uh, runner for miles around and we, we remember you running um, and winning such and such a competition and then they'd go into the goal the cry which is the bit that most people recognize. Um, and they would get the family members to come up and add to the dirge to say, those who wanted to. But they would know enough about the person to, you know, really bring it out. So all the, all the achievements of that person. But then there would also be anger coming out. They'd, be, they'd start berating the person. What do you think you're doing going and leaving your wife without a provider? How is she going to feed the children? That type of thing hmm. and then invite you know the family to come and do that and then everybody would join in in the gulf the cry if they could you know the ho and ho or the allaloo those are the 
aru aru, those, those are the main funeral cries. Um, so the, these three parts would just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. And there'd be a break, and then they would have some weight gains, might have something to eat, and then back at it again. So it was like drilling down and drilling down and drilling down. Um, so because they were so highly personalized, as I say, there are very few there are fragments that have been remembered because of the height of disrespect to actually record something in there. You can't do that. So it's just when people remember, would remember a particular tune, remember a particular set of words that were used. And there would be a specific sort of tune that would be used quite a lot in any given district in Ireland. So there'd be kind of a signature tune. I mean, I noticed that in the north where I come from, it tends to be much higher. Um, down in the south, it tends to be lower. You know, that type of a thing. But the, the, the religious kings, because it was about Christ, who was a universal figure, um, there wasn't the same, it, it, there's a real openness. And there's, the wonderful thing about them is it, it, they focus on the humanity of Mary. The kings are called the kings of the three Marys. And that's mm. Mary, his mother, Mary Bethany, Mary Magdalene, who was probably his wife, and um, Mary of Cleophas, who was probably his aunt. And they were, you'll see them all over Ireland. There are these images in graveyards of a crucifix with three women around the bottom of it. And that's what it is, it's the three Marys. It's this medieval thing. And there were a few keens uh, composed, and they are extremely beautiful. And they're focusing on the human uh, suffering, hmm. watching this suffering going on. Um, and uh, they're very, very powerful and very earthy. You know, was that the son that you suckled? How can he be up on that tree? And then, you know, she has a conversation with him and say, "How? Who is that man? Who? Who is it?" And he says, you know, "Don't you even recognize me?" And things like that. They're so powerful. These kings. Yeah, I say that when I teach a king in class, I say we're going to learn some religious kings. I can feel some sort of groans going on. <laughs> and I say, "You got to relax. These are the only real kings that we have solid." There's one more, which is Keen of Artillery, which is a big epic thing, you know. These are these are doable Keens <laughs> and within a within a class context. Um, and it's about the humans. You know, it's it's they're not proselytizing. That's not what it's about. It's just they were written for Christ. So that's another piece, another sort of branch to all of this, but it has preserved a lot of stuff. And I know that nowadays those Keens are more likely to be sung at funerals than the improvised ones because in many ways the the art of it has gone because it, ha it isn't it just hasn't been practiced enough you know it's still there in some areas in some well talked areas for sure the irish speaking areas but generally speaking it's you know it's been a, a dying thing having said all that the wake is coming back even to the point where recently you know, I was just going along a road and I saw a sign wake with an arrow towards the house. Now, you know, this would not, this would not have happened 10 years ago. Hmm. So it's coming back in Ireland. People are beginning to realize what amazing, um, it's already there. You know, people look outside themselves, uh, you know, to, to Eastern traditions. which are fabulous, you know. But we already have a tradition. And that one is being ignored in favor of these ones because somehow that feels more accessible and so it's great to see this stuff coming back and people pulling on those ancestral roots you know yes and then maybe we will once again have people in small communities like that who who know how to keen or who and who can offer that maybe that maybe that should be part of a death doula's experience of but of course it, as you said it has to be someone who's able to sing and able to manage the artistry of it yeah and you know it, it is it, it's very intricate you know um and so if you're brought up in the irish tradition then it's easier i mean i teach keening uh, some keens to people but it takes for a small keen it takes a long time because you've got to get your the way the, the way that tunes work in the Irish tradition are modal rather than diatonic, and certainly in the states that um, the Western ear has been tuned diatonically, so it sounds wrong. 
It's exotic and wrong. <laughs> it sounds wonderful when an Irish person does it, but when they try to do it themselves, they keep trying to correct it. <laughs> mm, interesting. <laughs> yeah, and it's because their ear is diatonic. You know, it's, it's you know, you, you just you're used to do re mi fa sol la ti do scale. You're not used to one of the modes, and those are the ones that are adopted. And so there are these little half notes going on. And the music is closer to Middle Eastern music. Now, let me tell you another thing about the word keen, which, and I only found this out recently in my own research, um, uh, on an 18th century document, 19th century document, in the 1800s, um, the etymology of the word keen. Now, the word keen in Irish is creenu or creenu, C-A-O-I-N-E, and the verb creenu means to cry. With, with, uh, with lamenting, it's loud crying, whereas gull, G O L, a gull is crying tears. Krina is more, you know, and specifically about lamenting. Well, according to this article, and I have no reason not to believe it, um, it all started off in Israel, or what is now Israel, but ancient Hebrew hmm. in Palestine, actually, with the word kinet, C I N E T, which meant clapping hands and lamenting and that one of the things that keeners would do would be they would do this sort of a thing hmm. so that word kinet moved into old irish kina c-i-n-e which then morphed into kina c-a-o-i-n-e which then is anglicized as keen k-e-e-n so there's this long line right back to ancient hebrew with this particular practice and in the Middle East, I remember on television seeing many, many years ago a Middle Eastern funeral, and they were definitely keening, but it was men, not women. Mm. It was all the men. But it's the same thing. In Greece, you know, there would be, in the Peloponnese Islands, there, there would the tearing of hair and beating of breasts, they'd rip their clothes virtually, you know, wailing. All the hair would be unbound. All, it's very similar, but as I said at the very beginning, it comes out differently in different cultures, but it's the same organic reaction to death. The difference about the Irish keen is that it's a ritual. It's not just the, key, the, the goal part of it. It's not just that crying part of it. And that's a mistake I think people make, that they think that that is what keening is. It's a part of it. It's not what the Irish keen is. So um, uh, that took me a while to sort out because I couldn't work out why people were referring to keening when just somebody was wailing. And I thought, oh, keening. <laughs> but then I realized it's, it's cultural, you know. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I, I was really interested that you mentioned um, the keen as part of this keening tradition, bringing in anger and having an opportunity to express anger because i think that's largely missing from our rituals but it's also really necessary because under the surface for all of us when someone we care about dies there's anger for all sorts of things but most of us repress it and we we just shove that aside and don't deal with it and i i mean i was thinking about after my father's death it took me years before i could finally admit that i was actually angry at my dad and address that anger and it seems like it would be so therapeutic to be able to do it as part of the ritual yeah it's very much you know that the five stages of di death and dying the elizabeth kubler ross thing you know because you know, the first one is, you know, denial or disbelief. Well, if you're a, sitting there with a dead body and somebody's speaking to that dead body using their name, it's very hard to deny it. It begins to crack that one. You know, you may turn away, but it's still there. So, you know, we, we have open coffin, you know. we. Have, um, I have two brothers who passed. They were both open coffin as well. You know, and it's it's shocking in many ways but it also helps you really begin to accept when my father passed i was in um, the states and and when my brother passed i was in the states and i have to say the funeral directors were great they kept they kept it open for a couple of days so i could get home and you know it was so important for me to see the dead body to really begin to take it in so that's that's the first one you know then there's the um the sorrow that's all in the 
throughout and the gall, the cry, you know, it, it's, it, it's heartbreaking. And that very specific, again, those very specific verses where you'd express the sorrow, what am I going to do without you? What am I going to do without you? How am I going to live without you? All of that stuff's there. The anger, yeah, you know, you know what do you think you're doing? You know, I mean, how, how dare you? Not now. The who's going to bring in the heart? You know, the anger would be there as well. Um, the bargaining, I would say, comes sometimes into that goal. It really does. There's a pleading sense, you know, that, that instead of saying, oh, let it be me, instead of why wasn't it me, instead of you, there's a sort of a pleadingness that comes in just into the, the musicality of it, you know, that, ah, 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 that sort of, it's just, ah, you know. Um, and then the acceptance, like I said earlier, that begins when they've all broken the state with, you know, taking away the chairs. And then also when the people come back from, from the funeral, there would have been a couple of people who would have stayed behind, put the house back like it had been, hmm. you know, which was a very important piece. So acceptance could begin, you know? So I, th I think it was really, again, you know, these were, as you know, identified by Kubler-Ross. It didn't mean that she created these. She just very smartly observed and identified um, in the 1960s, I think it was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so it seems to me that, again, people had known these things instinctively. Um, but, you know, this veneer of niceness <laughs> that mm -hmm. we were all brought up in, <laughs> whatever, you don't do that. And my first experience of this, what really got me into this, was when my own mother died, um, when they closed the coffin. And I let out the most almighty shriek. And I felt it in my solar plexus. I felt this feeling, which I'd never felt before. And it was a mixture of panic and something else. I didn't know what it was. And it literally came out of my mouth like a bellow, like a, just a shriek. And I couldn't stop. I just couldn't stop. And my brain was going, you can't do this. You can't do this. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. You can't do this. You have to be reverent. You know, that very, you have to be nice. You have to be reverent. And I had to run around the back of the house. I was so distraught. And it was only after that that... Um, I began to think, was I keen? Is that what it was? Was that a keen? And then reports that I've read, you know, that that was exactly what it was. It was the mm. organic keen. It was the it was the reactive keen. It was the everything was built around this. This is the reaction to losing somebody that you love very much. And so um, that's what started me on this journey. And that was about twenty five years ago now. <laughs> Hmm. Of, of looking for this and I made an album um, which is out in Sony then called Celtic Requiem and I made that in uh, two years after my mum died and I was so clueless I didn't even realise that I was making it for my mum it was my own eyes to her I, you know I just felt this compulsion to, <laughs> to gather keens and to, you know to find them and to find songs about death and you know um, and that was the beginning of it. And then I went into the academic world because it just became, drew me in, you know. But yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. And it's, how can I put this? As like with all things, the more I learn, the less I know. But, mm -hmm. You know, it, it has such deep, deep roots, such ancient roots that mm -hmm. there's so much that we may never know about it, I guess, <laughs> that... From the and, past. and you know we have to remember that you know it it arose in very different circumstances than we live the ones we live in today. So how how can we put ourselves into the mindset of somebody five thousand years ago? You know, I mean, it's very difficult. Um, and yet at the same time, there are some things that haven't changed, like nature. You know, when we have these ancient oak trees or these ancient forests, um, and that to me is the bridge, hmm. you know, holding on to that, the oceans, you know, holding on to, to the, the, the seasons, the, the, the way that nature runs, that's reasonably consistent, even though there's 
there's changes, you know, um, but it's still, still in these islands, we still have distinguishable seasons. When I lived in California, there were two seasons, wet and dry. But, you know, here and, and over here, there are definitely four seasons. They may not be as dramatic as they used to be or as extreme as they used to be, but um, they're distinguishable. So that, that to me is a big bridge. And I think that that also is, is where I think we can feel ancestry most. Yeah, and that's interesting having rituals that honor the changing of the seasons. And I myself, I've always... I've always loved winter time because of that that feeling of going underground and of everything slumbering and dying in a way so that it can be reborn in the spring. And I think that that image is something that we definitely need to reclaim for ourselves. I think I think it's a really good starting point because I think people get really, you know, sort of overwhelmed by all this. Well, we can't possibly do that. I wouldn't know where to start. How do I go? How do I do this? Um, I did a class on cleaning. I think it was last year and you know uh, there's been a big thing in England called the HS2 project which is where basically they're putting this massive speed train which is really unnecessary in many people's opinions including mine <laughs> obviously um, but they're cutting down forests mm -hmm. to put this speed train through which is only going to add 20 minutes or take off 20 minutes to a, it's a high speed thing so it's a vanity project in my opinion. But there was one of my students um, who lived in England and um, she was very distressed by this. And she went out into the wood um, and she heard the saws and she just burst into this wail, hmm. grief. And she had her phone with her and recorded it. And it was a completely improvised key in there and then. She played it to us, it was very powerful. Um, so, you know, in its rawest sense, anybody can keen if they can get in touch with those feelings and let them out through their voices. And it's, it's quite good if you can do it in nature, but, you know, you do run the risk of sort of, you know, uh, being considered rather odd. <laughs> <laughs> if you suddenly burst into this wail in a forest, you know, That's true. <laughs> there is a risk there. <laughs> um, but, you know, I know that there are these grieving circles that are springing up all over the States. I, I haven't had particular experience of them, but I have had some students who have. And they seem to be very powerful. But I think and imagine that is what's happening. They've been given permission to finally let this go, to get in touch with it and let it go. You know, mm. so I think that is happening. As you've been speaking, I, I had a memory come back to me that after my father died, it was the next day after his funeral, I went to his gravesite alone because I couldn't express all of my grief with everyone else. I went there alone. I, I held the dirt, you know, that was on top of his grave in my hands and some of the flowers that were there. And these sobs came from me from the deepest part of me that I'd never heard before. I'd never heard myself sob in that way before. And I stayed there for a few hours. And that was probably one of the best things I could have done in terms of my own grieving process being there. But, but you made me realize that was, in, that was instinctual. I just, I didn't know what I was doing or why I was doing it or why I even needed to do that. But by putting myself in that place and it, and he was buried in a, um, up on a hillside and there were trees nearby and there were birds singing and it was that connection with nature and with the earth and the flowers and holding them in my hands that that made that such a rich experience for me yeah that was that was just brilliant you know i mean i think we can be brilliant if we get out of our own way you know? <laughs> if we allow this, instead of listening to this if we listen to this Yes, and maybe just put ourselves in a position of being alone and being still somewhere. And and I think you're so right about connecting to nature. That really helps these deep, this deep grief to come to the surface for us. It does. And I mean, you know, it, it helps lots of emotions. I mean, um, we went walking. Uh, I've just moved. I'm actually living in the United Kingdom at the minute, and I've just moved. And we went walking in a bluebell wood. The bluebells are out at this time of year here. And they're only out for a few weeks. And I mean, the bluebells are in profusion. And it was an ancient forest. It was eight, 900 years old, this forest. And um, we walked through it. And the 
place carpeted in bluebells and it was magical and joyous and that's that was the feeling I just felt so uplifted by being among those bluebells you know so I think I think it can it can really help us if, if we give us ourselves the time and the space to do it I think it can really help us to get in touch with our finer selves um, yes, our yes. sensory selves you know that the that do reach beyond this world, you know? Well, Mary, tell us uh, what you're offering. I know that you have online workshops and courses. Do you have anything coming up that people might be interested in? Well, I, I do offer a course. The best thing to do, to be honest, is to go to my website, sign up for the newsletter, because that's the one thing that I don't, I don't bombard people with newsletters. I don't, I don't, have the time for one thing and I don't really think everybody wants to know what I'm thinking every two minutes but what I do there is I make an announcement I put out a newsletter once every couple of months or whatever it is and I make an announcement of this class is coming up and registration is now so that's the best way to find out I'm currently in the middle of a class of fairy song I'm doing that right now the next one I'll be doing I will be doing another class on the keen which will be beginning at the end of August I'll go on for two months it's online it's on a sunday evening for eight weeks that's that'll be that one um when i do these classes there they are song classes and so people do need to sing or be able to hold a tune i'm not expecting people to be able to sing in irish not be able to or, or even have to be familiar with the style but they need to be able to sing they need to be able to hold a tune because it's, they're not for beginners as singers um Last year, I ran two different kinds of keen classes, which I might do again. One of them was much more informational, and anybody could come on that. It was just sort of information, and you know, um, similar to what I've just given you, you know. Um, uh, and then the other one was focusing specifically on some songs. But to me, they're all so integrated that I prefer to do the two, you know, together. So that's that's the best thing to do. Just sign up for the newsletter. Um, so I'm taking a little while off because I have been. I've had a very frantic year with moving, etc., and um, coming back in again in August doing that keening class. And then I always that takes us right up to near to Samhain. You know, it takes us to near the end of October. Then I always do the Gaelic Christmas class, which is um, which is another album that I made called Gaelic Christmas Songs and I actually founded a Gaelic choir in California which ran for seven years and only stopped because I left America um, but um, it was a tremendously joyous experience and these songs are just so uplifting just they're ancient carols and all in Irish um, so that's I, I do that one round so it ends up just before Christmas so that everybody's got at least one little Irish song that they can sing at Christmas mm. <laughs> to, to, to amaze and entertain their friends. <laughs> well, so, that sounds wonderful. Everything's online at the minute, you know. I mean, I don't know when COVID's going to end. <laughs> and um, I love working in person too. Um, so, you know, that might happen down the line. But what I love about the online experience is you can get such a tremendous, you know, international audience. Yes. Without ever be going to massive expense. Yes, it's amazing well, and yeah. wonderful to bring people together. And I feel like single handedly you're reviving the keen at least by teaching teaching people and uh, well, well, I wouldn't and there are other people out there doing different pieces of work around this and you know and you know we all we always stand on show people's shoulders i mean this research i've done was done in by people who were just dedicated to this when nobody else was um tremendous amounts of literature about it um in ireland and it's quite obscure you have to dig it up but tremendous stuff and i i wouldn't know what i know without them, you know. So, and, and I know there are people out there who are teaching keening as well, I think. I think I've heard of one or two. But um, I'd like to do it my way, which is a mixture of, you know, the, the, the academic side of it and the practical side of it. It's just, I suppose it's just who I am, really. <laughs> yes. 
Oh, Mary, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and learn from you about wakes and keening. And I want to thank you so much for taking time out and joining me. Oh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you as well. You're very actively involved here. You know? <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's very fascinating to me. I have just a tiny bit of Irish heritage, tiny bit of of lineage so I know like need I to said, rediscover it <laughs> yeah, but, like, but I also said this is a universal practice that's true it's a universal European it's like the fairy work you know the mythologies they're universal they're not they're not they're, there's each one's got a different flavor according to the country it comes from but the same themes keep coming up over and over and over again and they're basically you know human themes that the, the mm -hmm. stuff that we struggle with at yes. nighttime when there's nobody else there, you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff, you know, um, it's the, it's the stuff that we, that we feel in the world. It's the stuff that we get triggered by. It's the stuff that we fall in love with. It's all of those things and they are just common to humans. Um, but they will come up differently depending on, on societies. So. Yes, and, and it's wonderful when we can learn some of these traditions and rituals that, and remember that that's what can help us even today as we're as we're going through challenging times. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I give a big hooray for nature at the minute. I'll tell you, it's keeping me sane. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> very true. Oh, thank you well, so much, Karen. Thank you, Mary. And uh, I'll send listeners again to your website, marymclaughlin.com. So. so can I just say one little thing? It's, I know it looks like Laughlin and it is in America Laughlin, but it's actually Lachlan. Lachlan. Oh, thank it's you. Irish Lachlan. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I don't mean to be, um, but it, it, sometimes I just, uh, people get it, hear it as Laughlin, they don't realize. And what it really means is, believe it or not, son of the Vikings. Ah. Oh. The Lachlan or the Lachlan-y were the Vikings. Oh, interesting. So, all right That's half danish mary mclaughlin oh yeah <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Actually, it's my fault completely because i should have checked before we started I usually oh, just check. yeah i should have asked you as well i just oh, assumed yeah. i knew how to pronounce no, it no, no, it is no no karen don't feel because i know from living in the states it's often pronounced as laughlin over there i know that you know so it's that's why i usually try to you know, try to make sure that you just know that's the Irish thing. So if you keep remembering Viking, <laughs> the, you're a Viking at heart. <laughs> I know. Well, my father's lot wear anyway. I don't know about my mother's lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Mary, and take care. Yourself right. too. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mary McLaughlin. I now pronounce her name correctly, and I apologize once again to her for getting that wrong in the first place. I so enjoyed learning about this ancient Irish history of uh, keening and wakes, though we know that, as Mary told us, it's not just Irish culture and Celtic culture, but also beyond that and found in Israel and the Middle East as well. And one of the things that stood out to me in our conversation was the fact that the wakes and keening include expressing anger. And I think that that's really important. As I said, I found for myself, my own anger was repressed for a very long time after the death of my father. And I think it's good that we can acknowledge in the moment during a funeral and mourning ritual that it's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel all of the emotions that we feel. And so I really appreciated hearing about that. And I've, I've long been a believer that we need more robust rituals around funerals and all aspects of the end of life. So I think there's something for all of us to learn from these ancient customs of holding wakes and keening and mourning together. 
And I also wanted to mention the book, My Father's Wake by Kevin Toulis. This is the second time that book has been recommended to me. So I wanted to mention it again. I'm leaving a link for that in the show notes if any of you are interested in checking that out as well. I'm very interested, especially because twice now it's been highly recommended. So if you enjoy content like this, please share it with anyone else who might also benefit from listening. Let them know about the podcast and how to subscribe to it on whatever podcast platform they happen to use. And if you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to either subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you're listening. And then if you're so inclined, leave a rating and a review because that helps us rise up in the rankings so that more people can find this content more easily. And once again, you can go to eoluniversity.com slash support and find three ways of helping me with this podcast and keeping it on the air. You can buy me a coffee. And thanks for all the coffee. I've been loving it from, from the people who've stepped up to buy me a coffee. And you can also make a one-time donation through PayPal, or you can become a supporter on Patreon with a monthly or annual contribution and get bonuses there. So thanks again to all of you who've been helping out for the last few years. I really appreciate it. And next week, I'll be back with another interview for you. Until then, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear. Be ready for whatever life brings you next. And love each and every moment of your precious and fleeting life. Bye-bye.